This seminar takes place in the run-up to the 30th session of the Intergovernmental Committee that meets uh, from May 30 to June 3, and it addresses intellectual property and genetic resources. The seminar provides a wonderful opportunity for the negotiators in the IGC to meet less formally and discuss the key unresolved issues in a less formal context. We have uh, marvelous speakers from around the world, 25 different countries, representing governments, indigenous peoples and industry. The seminar will address four main unresolved issues. The first is the interface between the work of WIPO and other processes. And the second are the policy objectives, which is a key uh, outstanding question. The third uh, roundtable addresses the disclosure requirement and the fourth roundtable addresses databases. And I'm very hopeful that the seminar will be a very good lead-in to the IGC session starting on Monday. So today's seminar we were talking about international legal instruments that are related to genetic resources and to indigenous and local communities and small-scale farmers and how they relate to one another and how they relate to the negotiations going on here at WIPO. And what we've really discovered is that these instruments were created piecemeal and one would react to another one and so instead of just saying oh what is happening in this mandate what are the you know are we trying to achieve here at WIPO and what are the beneficiaries that we are trying to affect we need to actually look across instruments and ask what are the objectives and beneficiaries across them but also what impact do we have on other instruments who's benefiting but who also might be harmed who might lose and what does that mean for public policy so the real message I think today was to get beyond the narrow mandates and to look more broadly so that public policymakers can have a more systematic view and make better policy. And this seminar was very uh, useful, I think, and hopefully it will inform some of the discussions that are coming up for this new session of the IGC. Uh, we're in a new context with a renewed mandate from the IGC, as well as last year having concluded at the United Nations level the Sustainable Development Goals, also the conclusion of a new agreement on climate change. So we have a broad framework that now should also inform the continuation of negotiations in the IGC. This session I tried to um, discuss the linkages with other international uh, legal frameworks, uh, in particular the Convention on Biological Diversity and the Nagoya Protocol, as well as the Food and Agriculture Organization Treaty on Plant Genetic Resources for Food and Agriculture, um, alongside um, other important instruments in the area of human rights law. As we know, there is important developments taking place with regards to um, rights of peasants and other rural workers, as well as um, with regards to transnational corporations and so regulating some business practices. Um, and then uh, the intellectual property framework is in this uh, discussion uh, finding a place for how it should evolve to also find coherence in the implementation and complement um, the objectives of the broad overall legal framework. So I very much look forward to the discussions in the IGC next week. Uh, yes, um, basically what I was saying is that when you're talking about the objectives of what the IGC is trying to accomplish around genetic resources, there's no need to look um, specifically at the ABS system because the ABS system functions outside of the intellectual property system. You should concentrate on what the intellectual property system needs to do to make ABS work and what it needs to do is it needs to do what it does which is provide information it needs to do that better and it needs to provide information on the origin and source of genetic resources and traditional knowledge by having a disclosure requirement. Because that is exactly what intellectual property system does and the ABS will be taken care of under national legislation and outside of the IP system. My message today was um, three, I focused on three policy objectives and the most important of these was the, uh, the use of well, the promotion of innovation through the patent system. The patent system, according to a number of economic studies, has been shown to uh, increase the number of jobs in small companies, to increase sales, and to uh, increase a firm's chance of success overall. We have a, a proposal on the table called uh, a new disclosure requirement that could threaten the grant and uh, the grant of a patent and also revoke a patent. This could have the potential to take away these incentives uh, that are provided under the patent system. So that is uh, of a big concern to the U.S. delegation. 
the, uh, some alternatives would be to focus on objectives such as providing relevant prior art to patent examiners. Um, I mentioned earlier the Traditional Knowledge Digital Library, which is a, a wonderful database produced by the Indian Council of Scientific Industrial Research, and how that tool has been valuable at USPTO. It's also been used by other offices, such as the European Patent Office, and how a study by Professor Chowdhury looked at the uh, implications of the use of the TKDL and how it has impacted um, patent quality and other factors, and it found that um, after use of the TKDL, patent grants on herbal, uh, herbal inventions tend to be uh, more distinct from the prior art and, and less uh, weak patents. So we see that as a, an area that could become a, a further work stream in the IGC. And uh, we also see another area that could be a further work stream is the use of national laws outside of the intellectual property system. That's another objective. And um, I gave earlier the example of the U.S. Uh, national Park System, Yellowstone National Park in particular, where uh, national laws were created that would require bioprospectors to obtain permits in order to, to collect samples and as a part of the permit process they'd have to enter into uh, cooperative research and development agreements that would allow us to transfer benefits and to prevent misappropriation. All these concepts are, are very much relevant to the discussion next week because uh, I believe that the objectives are key to, to driving the, the negotiations next week and coming up with a meaningful outcome. Para la Secretaría General de la Comunidad Andina es un placer participar aquí y eh, llamar la atención sobre algunos temas que tienen que ver con la protección de los conocimientos tradicionales y de los recursos genéticos en general y en particular para los cuatro países que integran la Comunidad Andina, Bolivia, Colombia, Ecuador y Perú. Estos cuatro países son mega diversos y en consecuencia de ello debe ser protegido este patrimonio. Por ello la comunidad andina desde el año 96 cuenta con una normativa al respecto de protección a los recursos genéticos y a los conocimientos tradicionales, haciendo un vínculo muy fuerte con la propiedad intelectual. También contamos con la decisión andina 486 que eh, asiste también a la decisión 391 en razón de que, de que no se concederán derechos de propiedad intelectual siempre que estos hayan sido solicitados en violación de una norma que contraven el patrimonio, digamos que, que vaya en contra del patrimonio genético de los países de la comunidad andina. Por tanto, es importante para poder evitar una apropiación indebida de los conocimientos tradicionales y de los recursos genéticos en nuestros países, contar con una información adecuada. Y esta información adecuada, como un objetivo de política, eh, tiene que ser una información clara, completa, veraz y oportuna para que tanto los examinadores de patentes cuanto las personas que externamente quisieran poder impedir que alguien eh, se apropie de un conocimiento tradicional o de un recurso genético de forma indebida pueda ejercer las acciones del caso. Y para ello la comunidad andina está trabajando en apoyo a sus países y los países tendrán que tomar algunas decisiones eh, de negociación tanto en foros multilaterales como este, tanto en, dentro del foro andino y para ello eh, están los países parecería prestos para iniciar un proceso de reforma de la normativa andina vinculada con los conocimientos tradicionales y con los recursos genéticos. Today I spoke about the very recent changes in Brazilian legislation concerning biodiversity. Uh, the law entered into force late last year and the rules of application were just released two weeks ago, so we are still learning uh, about how to implement everything. But the important point is that the previous uh, uh, act on biodiversity had serious flaws, it stifled innovation, it was very punitive, and so we, we did not take fuller advantage of our own biodiversity wealth as you know, Brazil is one of the most biodiverse countries in the world. So we, uh, we, we introduced a, a new disclosure requirement. There was one in place, but this one is very easy to uh, comply with. So it's simple, it doesn't take any time, and uh, businesses were heard, uh, traditional communities were heard, uh, users and producers were heard, and this law was voted with a large majority in a time of political polarization. I think that uh, this attitude, the learning from one's mistakes and trying to f fine tune the system all the time, is something that 
uh, can maybe contribute to discussions next week, we were ready to share this experience more closely with other delegations. And of course, we are here also to listen and to hear from everyone. So I'm the moderator of the Roundtable 3, and I'm fully convinced that it is of importance and of benefit for delegates if they have a look at the WIPO website where they can see what we discussed again. Because we looked at the highly important issue of disclosure requirement from different angles. And you know what? We reached consensus on many things on how to move forward. The most important thing in order to move forward is to disentangle the discussions, to distinguish between focusing on the design on a new, of a new uh, system of disclosure requirements and to focus on the underlying principles. By recognizing the underlying principles, I'm convinced that we all will reach a win-win solution. A win-win solution is a solution that gives not only minimal requirements on an international level, but maybe also maximal requirements, so that both sides, users and those who give the resources to the system can benefit. To conclude, I would like to quote what a former US president said when he was asked on how to make progress. And he said, you have to be aware, if we always do what we always did, we will always get what we always got. Or, to say it in a different way, when Stacey Allison, the first woman to climb Mount Everest, was asked how did she succeed, she said, you know what, it's these little steps, they add up. My main message really was to remind us that most of the world's population is already under a disclosure regime. This is an international moment for the community of all member states of WIPO to come together to establish minimum baselines um, and to give us some ground rules that can guide countries as they begin to discover um, how best to design their national disclosure rules. I'm hoping that this will feed into the IGC uh, debate um, and discussion and negotiations next week. Given the reality of the disclosure requirement, given the importance of cross-border innovation, uh, the disclosure requirement is now more than ever an imperative and getting the design right requires everyone to participate. Yeah, important message is that the databases are playing an important role in preventing misappropriation of traditional knowledge. India has the experience of developing possibly the first major database on traditional knowledge. We call it the Traditional Knowledge Digital Library. This database is being used to challenge a lot of erroneously grant, granted patents in several jurisdictions. And uh, we are using this uh, database to good effect. A uh, large number of patents have already been revoked. And we are doing it in partnership with 10 uh, patent offices in, in different countries and the number of patent offices will grow as uh, we expand the work of this t t uh, the TKDL. The other important thing that is important is there for us is that uh, we also have uh, databases developing at the local community level. You know, you know that the local communities are protecting the knowledge and the resources for us and in India uh, we are uh, developing uh, what we call people's biodiversity registers which is a database databases of the knowledge and the uh, uh, genetic resources which are owned by the local communities and this to my mind will provide a very good basis for uh, uh, granting uh, you know positive protection to the local communities well, uh, the, um, the participation in the seminar was very useful. We were very much, uh, I was very much uh, interested in the uh, disclosure requirement uh, discussions, which I felt was very interesting because we were able to uh, discuss uh, in detail uh, the, the scope 
and the level of uh, disclosure that is required in national and regional and international uh, uh, norm setting process. I also participated as a, as a speaker in the defensive measures uh, 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 session and I, I realized that there was a lot of interest in trying to find out the role that databases play in the uh, IGC discussions. And in my view, I think databases are complementary to the discussions of uh, identifying or of uh, concluding an international instrument. And I believe if uh, this approach is taken, uh, we'll be able to uh, 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 reach uh, a consensus on this. Uh, even though some uh, people uh, question the role of databases uh, in, in search and examination uh, of, of national uh, uh, patent offices, we still felt that uh, probably there may be uh, the need for us to differentiate uh, those databases Bases, uh, those that are in publicly, uh, those that are publicly available, those that are, are actually uh, held confidential, and if we also uh, approach databases development this way, we, I believe we will be able to protect the uh, the interests of uh, the indigenous and local communities, whilst at the same time also use elements of the databases which are already published as prior art to prevent erroneous grant of patents. Thank you. Um, I think for uh, the discussions of uh, this week and also next week, we have to focus on the common objectives that we all have, which is ensuring that there is an effective system uh, to have compliance with ABS rules, uh, and also that we are looking at the objectives of an IP system, which is, for instance, avoiding the erroneous granting of patents. It is the industry's opinion that uh, there is already a lot of work done in national laws, regional laws, to ensure there is effective compliance with ABS laws, but that there is reinforcement to be done on IP issues related to the erroneous granting of patents through facilitating systems. However, linking the two together by having disclosure obligations to ensure compliance with ABS systems to us doesn't seem to be an effective way of dealing with these issues. And so we hope that the debates we had this week uh, would be very useful for the discussions that the delegates will have next week for an informed discussion uh, and maybe agreement on things. Well, my main message at this seminar has been to give a traditional knowledge holder's perspective on the utilisation of databases. And what I've suggested is that national databases are going to be limited in their accuracy because of all the issues around sacred knowledge and mistrust of passing on knowledge to government agencies. And you're more likely to find accurate databases at a local level that are managed by communities. So I felt it was important to make that intervention here and uh, feed it into next week's IGC. As, we, as states begin to explore in more detail how functional these databases can be. Hi, uh, my name is China Williams. I'm from the Royal Botanic Gardens, Q. Um, I took part in this uh, seminar to um, give everyone an, an idea of the kind of databases um, that are created at Q, primarily scientific databases. Um, Q recently did um, a study that showed that there are over, over 30,000 plants have a recorded plant use and that's out of a total of 400,000 plants. So we need to record a lot more uses. One of the key issues uh, that we've heard, to, that we heard from patent offices is needing um, consistency in searches. So I think one of the things that scientific databases can help with is uh, helping find the right names for, for plants and also uh, a consistency in the way that plant use is recorded. The seminar has just finished and uh, I'm getting very good feedback on it. Um, the people who participated are saying, first of all, it was very frank, honest. People are very open about what's happening at the national level, which is very good. Uh, it was also very substantive and factual, a lot of rich information about what's happening in each country. And finally, I think they appreciated the very explicit link to the next week's IGC session. So I'm uh, very confident that the seminar has uh, set the stage for next week. 
I think all the delegates are uh, fully into the issues. The atmosphere was also this week at the seminar very, very good. And I'm confident that substantively and in terms of the atmosphere, we'll have a productive and good IGC session next week. All the resources from the seminar are on the website. There's uh, all the videos, uh, the short interviews and all the PowerPoints. And I encourage those watching this to go and look at those rich resources. Thank you.